subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello everybody, you all welcome to today's lesson on Joy Learning once again. It's a different edition altogether. And as you can see that we've actually muscled up so many strengths to actually take you through so many things that you need to learn. My name has always been Opoku and like oh, I, was, I always say it is science time so let's get glued. Now today the topic for discussion is straight and then you know it because you, you do it every time at home. As you see these different different um, suites being um, shown on our screens, I know some of you are thinking, what are, what are these? The black ones are dates. And then the other ones are, not all of them do, but we have almond here. And then the other ones that are not very, very common in Ghana. <laughs> but then as we go on, I know all of you have a fair idea of what they are. Now, do you know that when you get up very early in the morning, take a toothbrush, and then you wash your face and you want to even brush your teeth, a mixture is being produced in your mouth. Do you know that every food you eat in Ghana is also a mixture? Did you also know that every water you drink also has mixture in there? You ask me, but the water has been purified. It's going through processes. Every water, okay, has what is called dissolved or mineral salt. And the mineral salt is obtained from the soil. So as soon as you have that, then it tells everybody that this water has something else that is not as purified or distilled as it's perceived to be. Do you know why well water is, or it takes sweeter or kind of nicer as compared to the rainwater? Because rain is direct. There's no contact with salt. But every water that comes from the soil definitely has a mixture of the water itself and the salt. Let's hit it. With objectives, one, we would know what mixture or mixtures are. Two, we should be able to identify five physical characteristics of mixtures. We would also go to talk about the lists or the types of classifications of mixtures. We explain each type of mixture with at least one example. Discuss the classification of liquid, liquid mixture. We also explain briefly the types of solutions with examples of each. And then we also talk about separation of mixtures. I love that. You also identify the physical properties of separating mixtures. And then we identify four different methods of separating mixtures and explain each of them with diagrams. I know by now majority of you are running into your rooms to pick your notepads, your pens, and your pencils. With a blink of the eye, I would love you to be seated, glued to your seat, and then we kick the ball rolling. Shall we go on? A mixture is a physical combination of two or more substances which does not lead to the formation of a new product. So whenever you talk about a mixture, it means that something here has been brought or added up or combined to something there. And because these two have been put together, we say a mixture is produced. Always have it in mind that mixtures do not produce new things. Reason being that they are always in their physical state. When physical state means that there is no chemical bonding or chemical property being produced as a result of these two different things that have been brought together. Characteristics of mixtures. What do we see that makes us feel or think that this is a mixture? One, mixtures consist of two or more substances that are physically combined. When you hear physically combined, don't think of anything as being huge or something that is very difficult to understand. No. It is just self-explanatory. When I pick chalk, pieces of chalk, and I add them to stones or pebbles, 
and I put the chalk pieces and the pebbles that I've picked into a cup, I have a mixture. Somebody will say, really? Yes, I have a mixture. Reason being that these are two different things that have been brought or combined into a bowl or a cup. So that is a clear indication of a mixture. And because I can sit in the comfort of my home and then hand pick all the pebbles from the chalk pieces, it tells me that it is a complete physical combination. Because I don't need any chemical expertise or experience to be able to take the chalk pieces from the pebbles. Can do it outrightly. So it's a physical thought. The constituents of mixtures can be mixed in any ratio or proportion. So I can choose to pick 20 pebbles against five pieces of chalk. Or I can choose to pick 100 pieces of chalk against two pebbles. In any form or ratio, I would love to do it. Mixtures can come in any ratio. Or four. Number three, which is the third physical characteristic as far as mixtures are concerned. Individual constituents of mixtures can all always retain their properties. The fact that I brought pebbles together with pieces of chalk in one bowl doesn't mean that the bowls or the pebbles have been turned into chalk pieces. Neither will I also believe, or anybody will also believe, that the chalk pieces are turned into pebbles. It doesn't happen because each of them retain its physical property. Four, the constituents can be separated by ordinary physical means. So physical combination, physical means. I sit and then I pick them one after the other and then I take each of it from the other. Five, the composition of a mixture vary widely. So I can pick so many things and then bring them together. It means that me having one bowl of mixture can vary because I can have it being liquid and solid, solid and liquid, solid, solid, gas, gas, which I may not be even be able to see, but it's believed that it exists. Classification of mixtures. This is where we go deeper to talk about the types of mixtures, if I can put it that way, and know what kind of mixtures we have and what do they mean. One, there are six different types of mixtures depending on the state of the constituent. And the state means that is it in the solid form, the liquid form, or in the gaseous form? Each of these one, when brought together, when I pick liquid gas brought together, gives me a different kind of mixture. When I pick liquid and then solid put together, that also prevents or presents itself as a different form of mixture. And all these are what you are going into details to discuss as classification of mixtures. Now these are one, we have solid liquid mixture. Solid liquid mixture. What if I pick pebbles or chalk pieces and I decide to put the pebbles in water? Is it a solid liquid mixture? Com Completely brilliant and yes, reason being that water is always liquid or at room temperature is supposed to be in a liquid form. And then when I have the chalk pieces or the pebble, which is always in the form because it has a definite shape. So when I bring them together, it doesn't mix up completely. How do I put pebbles into water and expect the pebbles to be like the water or have a uniform mixture of uniform form. It doesn't happen. So that gives us a clear indication of a solid liquid mixture. And we can have example as sugar in water. You are up to work or you are up for school and then you want to have a, 
a breakfast and then because you are in a hurry, you pick something, you cut it up in a sachet, you want to pour it into a mug or a glass and then add some warm water. As soon as you do that, you are doing this, which is called a liquid or solid liquid mixture. I get up early morning, I don't feel like eating, but I feel like taking a bit of sugar, which is bad though. So let's say I have a cube sugar, I want to divide a cube sugar into four, and I take one quarter of that, and then I put that into a very bigger bowl or a bigger mug of water. Uh, say lukewarm water, and then I allow it to dissolve completely in there. I have formed a solid liquid mixture. I wash my clothes, but accidentally or mistakenly, I forgot to pick the soap from the bowl of water. So I left it there. Now that forms a solid liquid mixture. Now let's go to number two, which is called solid gas mixture. Solid gas mixture. Solid gas mixture is a mixture that consists of solid particles and gaseous substances. So solid and gas mixture. We can have a clear example of smoke, smoke and dust. Let me go through dust first. Whenever a road is being constructed very close to your house, and then you are like me, who normally actually opens your window and then probably open your window blinds or get them on a higher height because you want to have free of fresh air. What do you see on your sofa, on your couch? You see dust. Now, you know why you see the dust? It's because dust is always in the form of the solid particles and then the gaseous part. So as it comes onto your sofa or your couch, it leaves the solid part on it. And then the gas aspect of it goes to where nobody knows. If you are very, very conversant with the olden modern or olden kitchen, whereby people use what is called muka, na local palance. Okay? When I say muka, like a tripod stand, I don't mean that, but I'm just trying to make reference to that whereby we use clay to build a pot, not like a pot, like a stove, if I can say it that way, and then on which we do our cookings. When you do that, you can see on the wall that because that kind or that traditional kitchen has firewood in its operation, when the gas that is coming or the smoke that is coming out from the fire is trying to escape, you always see the wallings of that traditional kitchen to be black. Reason being that the soot, S-O-O-T, the soot, forms part of the air. So as it's trying to come up from the fire, you see it as we see, like we call in our local parlance. So as it gets onto the wall, the solid part will now settle on the wall, leaving the gas escaping through any door or any window possible. This is a solid gas mixture. We have solid, solid mixture. And I gave a clear indication or a clear example as pebbles and then chalk pieces. Solid, solid mixture is a mixture that consists of two different solid substances. Example, we have here gari and sand. Solid, solid mixture. Gas liquid mixture. Gas liquid mixture is a mixture that consists of liquid substances containing dissolved gases. And a clear example is the carbonated drinks that we consume in our homes, our schools, workplaces, and other functions wherever we find ourselves. They are all part of that. We also have the sprays, the different variety and then the brands of spray that we use at home. Because when you spray onto your palm, you can see that your palms are wet. Okay? It is not the liquid part of the spray that brings about the nice perfume scent. It's rather the gas that comes with it. If it's the liquid part of it, how then do you walk in town? You just walk past somebody and go like, wow, this guy, this lady is, I mean, it smells so good. You know why? 
the spray the person uses is what is emanating from the body of the person. Gas, gas mixture. This is a mixture in which the constituent elements are gases. So we can have a clear example as air. 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 Now, every science student is supposed to know that air in its nature consists of other gases. Air is not only about oxygen. Even though that has a greater percentage of it, of it it doesn't mean that holistically it's all about oxygen. No. Let me take you through. Carbon dioxide is always present in air. And that is so negligible. It's so small. So it's 0.03%. When we come to oxygen, it takes 21%. When we come to nitrogen, that's also there. Water vapor is there. And then we have inert gases in their variance of proportion. Let's go to liquid, liquid mixture. This is a mixture that consists of two different liquid substances. Example, kerosene and oil. We are not there yet. I know that whenever you pour kerosene or you pour oil on a kerosene, one of it will just display the other. We we'll go on. Then we also have alcohol and water. Whenever you have alcohol and water, it displaces something. It tells you that this arm here and then you are there. So you see a clear difference between them. Classification of liquid liquid mixture. So let's talk about that one too. Liquid liquid mixture are classified, or liquid mixtures are classified based on the ability of the constituent forming a uniform mixture or a non-uniform mixture. Let me take you through this. If I have a glass of water here, and you have Sprite, this Sprite that we normally take, this drink that we take here, and you walk into the room or the place, and then I didn't tell you that this, 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 that, because they are in different containers or in a glass. How do you tell this is water and this is Sprite? You wouldn't have any clue because I wouldn't want you to waft it and actually get the smell or the scent of it. From afar, you can't tell because they are all colorless. When I put water and Sprite together, it forms what is called a complete uniform mixture. Until you taste it, you wouldn't know it is water or Sprite. You wouldn't know. So that is a complete explanation of the constituent forming either a uniform mixture or a non-uniform mixture. Based on that, liquid-liquid mixtures can be classified into two, which are, one, homogeneous mixture. Homo means one. Homo sapien, human being. So homogeneous mixture means one, the same thing. The same thing. The same thing here means that when you bring two different things together and they say they have a homogeneous mixture, it means there is no clear difference between any of the constituents. Like a clear example, as the Sprite and water. I would not allow you to taste until you, are, you taste it. That's when you go like, okay, there's water in there and the Sprite. And with that one, you even find it difficult to actually te uh, tell whether there's water. But by the taste of it, you can tell that the amount of sugar in there has gone down. That shows that there was some addition of water. And then we have two, which is called heterogeneous mixture. Different in the way they are. So two different things being brought together, whereby there's a clear difference between the two liquids being brought together. Homogeneous mixture. This is a solution in which the constituent element mixed completely together without any physical separation or difference. So here, water sprite all over again. Another name for homogeneous mixture is miscible liquid. Miscible liquid. Miscible liquid. Miscible liquids are liquid that are being brought together to the point that you can never take one from the other. A clear difference is completely zero. You don't see anything different. A very clear example of this is water and Sprite. Heterogeneous mixture. This is a mixture in which the constituents are not chemically combined or physically. You can see a clear difference between them. 
Another name for the heterogeneous mixture is immiscible liquid. So miscible liquid for homogeneous mixture. And then immiscible liquid. That means that it's not, I mean, you know this one, immiscible. It makes it immiscible mixture. Types of solutions. Let's go on there. Solution is a uniform mixture or uniform or homogeneous mixture of a solute and a solvent. So whenever you talk about solution, you need a solvent and then a solute to form a solution. Example is the sugar dissolves in water to form sugar solution. You can also talk about salt dissolve in water forming salt solution or what we call brine. B-R-I-N-E. There are three main types of solutions depending on the amount of solute dissolved in a particular amount of solvent. Basically, there are three, but there's one more that's been added to it by myself. The three types of solutions are one, dilute or diluted solution. It simply means that when I have a very small amount of sugar and I pour it into a larger quantity of water, then I have a dilute or diluted solution. Reason being that the amount of solute is lower or smaller than the amount of solvent. Dilute solution is a solution that contains less amount of solute as compared to the solvent. It can also be defined as a solution that contains less amount of solute dissolved in a solvent. Example, a, tables, a tablespoonful of sugar dissolved in 100 centimeter cube of water. Now we go to concentrated solution. If you want to taste sugar, it means the amount of sugar in a container or whatever you are tasting is higher. If you want to taste salt, the same thing happens to it. This is a solution that contains relatively more solute dissolved in a relatively small solvent. So like what you do, whereby you go to buy porridge, cocoa, how's that cocoa? And they tell the, the woman, Madam, I'm buying cocoa one city. Could you give me three tablespoons full of sugar? It is very bad. It means the sugar content will be so much concentrated, more solute in smaller amount of solvent. Example, dissolving 10 tablespoonfuls of sugar in 100 cm cube or centimeter cube of water. We go to saturated solution. A solution that cannot dissolve any more solute added to it at a given temperature. It's believed or we know for a fact that if I have so much water in so much salt and then I still see underneath the water or the pan that there's still additional salt that has not yet dissolved in the water the best way to go by this is to put the whole content or mixture on fire. When I do that, I'm only allowing an increase in temperature of the solvent, which is the water, so that it will give more room to dissolve extra salt or, uh, or sugar that I have in there. But whenever we say saturated, when at a, norm, or at a normal temperature, nothing can be done. When you put more, when you put one cup or let's say half cup of sugar into, let's say, um, one liter of water, okay, what you will see, you see so much sugar in the pan of where you have the water and it's completely saturated. It means it can no more dissolve any extra solute in there. We have example, or we have a particle of a solute that can still be seen in a saturated solution. Example, we have 20 uh, tablespoonfuls of sugar in water of 100 cm cube or centimeter cube. Saturated solution can be made unsaturated by increasing the amount of solvent or increasing the temperature of the mixture by heating. So if I have so much um, sugar in, let's say one liter of water, and I want every content of the sugar to dissolve, then it's either I add more water onto the one liter to increase the volume, or 
I put the whole mixture on fire so that as the whole mixture or the solvent increases by addition of heat, it will now be able to dissolve more solute. What I added was aqueous solution. Whenever you hear aqueous solution, it simply means any solute that finds itself in water. So when we say aqueous solution, the solvent here is water. Separation of mixtures. How to separate mixtures. If I have this mixture, how do I separate this mixture to be this mixture? That is what you want to do. This involves the separation of individual components that form the mixture. So if I have this and that, I remember in my school, I took students through a method of evaporation to get salt that has been dissolved in water. We had a very nice experiment in my school. My students were like, oh, really? I was like, OK, my mom sent me to go buy um, a sachet of salt. And when I was walking, I was walking with a friend called Kofi. So accidentally, as we played or as we were playing on the side of the road, I fell and then the salt came from the sachet because there was a hole in the sachet. Now, I don't want to be beaten, so I had to gather the salt with the sand a bit, packed it into the sachet and brought it home. Now, when we came home, we didn't go to my home because my mom sent me, so we'll go to Kofi's house. But we went to Kofi's house, I'm like, Kofi, what do we do? Kofi said, okay, fine, don't worry, we'll do this, and then we'll do it in a very fast way that is very difficult to even understand. I said, okay, let, let, okay, I'm just counting all my hopes on you. So what Kofi did was that Kofi poured the whole salt with the sand in a bowl, added so much water, and then we stared and stared and stared over again until we could no more see any salt underneath the pan. When we were done with that, Kofi said, now, we can see that the water or the solvent of this salt solution is very dirty. That is because we've been able to wash all the sand from this whole mixture. So now we do what is called decantation, whereby we slightly or slowly pick our bowl and then we slightly tilted it to get all the water in which we have the dirt in there to go away. Unfortunately, we couldn't get the entire water from the sand or from the salt. So as we poured it away, we are actually taking part of the salt away. So what do we do? Let's put it on fire and then see what happens. As it was boiled and boiled and overboiled, we could see that, okay, the water is actually evaporating from the whole thing. And then we are having the crystals, fine crystals of salt being left in our bowl. And then, because we didn't want to use the same sachet, we had to just yes, use a different sachet uh, rubber and then take it there. And then we had to tear part of it because, oh, I was helping my mother to easily get the salt because I had to just open the sachet with my mouth. And that's a beautiful thing. So separation of mixtures is largely dependent on the physical properties of the component or constituent, which includes boiling point or solubility. Solubility. Solubility is just a nature of where an item will be able to be soluble or to be able to dissolve in another thing or a solvent. Physical methods are the various methods that are used in separating mixtures based on their physical properties. So we go to the physical properties in separating mixtures. One, simple distillation. Simple distillation. It is defined as the method of separating two miscible. Miscible, it means that it has blended completely. You can't see any difference, like the water and the Sprite. That boil without decomposition and also have sufficient difference in their boiling point. So here, I need two different liquids. Let's say I go for water and I also go for alcohol. I always say that we all know that alcohol will always boil at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. When we come to alcohol, alcohol boils at a lower temperature of 78 degrees Celsius. So now 
I pour my alcohol into my water, whereby I have a miscible mixture or a miscible form. With that, how do I go through this whole process? Keep quiet, watch, and then I'll tell you. It can also be defined as the method of separating two miscible liquids by vaporizing one component of the mixture and then condensing the vapor back to pure liquid. So, voila. Examples of liquid that can be separated using this method is a volatile liquid from a non-volatile liquid. You know what a volatile liquid is? Let's see what they are. A volatile liquid is a liquid that can easily change to gas. So it means that it has a very, very lower boiling point. At the least um, addition of temperature increase, then it now transforms from whatever it is into a different form. So we have water and then ethanol or alcohol. The diagram here, as you can all see from our screens. So we have a round bottom flux. That is what we have here. I need to take you through all this. And then we also have a source of heat. But if you are doing a science particle, we'll need a tripod stand. So here is where I have impurities. I have whatever I don't want here. So here I have two miscible liquids. Two miscible liquids. So somebody will say apeja. Yes, apeja because we are here to do wonders. So we have two miscible liquids. So I have my alcohol and I have my water in my round bottom flask. Always have it in mind to also have a thermometer. A thermometer is any device that is used to check or test the temperature of a substance. So I have my retort stand displayed nicely to hold firmly my whole experiment, all the things that I will need for the experiment in place. I need a condenser as well, so I have everything here. I have the layer big condenser here. Good. Now with a condenser, I need Oh, I have two openings. I have an upper opening and a lower opening. The function of all these will be taking you through. So here, I now heat my mixture under high grade heat. What happens is that because alcohol actually has a lower boiling point, definitely from, so let's say from 0, 1, 2, 3, 50, 70, 75, 72, 73, 78 and then you see the alcohol evaporating moving up now because we have a cork that would prevent any gas from coming in or gas going out the gas wouldn't have anywhere than to rise through our tube which is called the delivery tube so inside the delivery tube the gas rises and then passes through the condenser with the condenser, the lower part of it has water inlet. The upper part has water outlet. So cold water is used or pushed through the condenser to actually cool the air or the gas that has evaporated from the whole mixture in which we had the round bottom flags. So as it goes and then we pump the cold air, the cold air will now change the gas from the state of it being gas into liquid. And so since we have a beaker, you see the gas dripping, pum, 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 into our beaker because we have changed the form of it being gas into liquid. So before we realize, you see every part of the gas being transferred here. And then that tells us that we've separated the liquid or the water from the alcohol or ethanol. Because at 76, 77, 78 boiling point of alcohol, so the alcohol comes out. 79, we've ended it. So 79, you don't expect alcohol to come. Whatever is coming is a different thing altogether. And then 80, 90, 100 is water. So by the which time you've gotten all your alcohol, take it away and then you have your complete form of that. We go to fractional distillation. This is another met, another type of separating or separation or separating distillation that is used to separate mixtures of volatile liquids. It is used in separating two or more miscible liquids that has 
its difference in boiling point less than 25 Kelvin. Example is the separation of crude oil into its various fractions, such as kerosene, petrol, diesel, LPG gas, and then even fuel for aeroplanes. Now, always have it in mind is that crude oil is where we obtain all this diesel and this kerosene and whatever we have as fuel from. And whatever that comes, or they are, if we get all these things, what we don't like as a byproduct is what is called the beauty men used on our roads. The apparatus is similar to that of the simple distillation, except that fractional column is fitted between the distillation flux and the condenser. This is the method used by Thema Oil Refinery in separating the different fractions of crude oil. So let's see what diagram this also has to offer. So this is the fractional distillation. So here we have the crude oil that has been heated in a furnace. I mean heated. And then here we have a condenser that actually, or we have fract uh, fractures. When I say fractures, I'm talking about fractions, whereby we have different, different, different layer in which we want to keep different, different fractions of the crude oil. So definitely, as it's heated, the component of, or the fractions of the crude oil that has the lower, lower, lower boiling point will not come up. So let's say the crude oil is at room temperature zero. So one, two, it increases, increases. So at 370 degrees, that is the highest. That is the full oil. At 150 degrees, we are having butane and propane. So... 20 degrees to 150, we are having petrol. 200 degrees, we are having kerosene. 300 degrees, we are having diesel. And then 370 degrees, we are having fuel oil, which is also very, very useful. Now, filtration. This is another method of separating the mixture that contains insoluble particles from liquids using a filter paper and a funnel. Let's see what that is. Example is a mixture of sand and water. Filtration can also be used to separate two solids where one is soluble in water. So you can have two solids where one can dissolve in water. So here I have my filter paper, I have my funnel, I have my filtrate, I have my beaker. Now because I've added two different liquids, or a solid and a liquid, but a solid must, must, be, uh, must be able to dissolve in water. So let's say I have um, sand and then water. Definitely, there will be a part of the sand that will just dissolve in the water, and another part will just will not. Definitely, you have a bit of pebbles or small, small stones in there. So I put a filter paper into my funnel, and then I slowly pour the content of my solution or my mixture in there. As I do that, I am just filtrating the residue from the filtrate. The filtrate is whatever that goes through the funnel through the filter paper, and then comes onto my beaker, or comes into my beaker. The residue is like what I don't want, what is left over. So whatever I have on the filter paper becomes the residue, of which are always in their solid state. Then we go to sublimation, a process by which a solid directly changes to gas without passing through the liquid state. And then we have substances that can go to sublimation like camphor or naphthalene balls. And then we also have iodine crystals. We also have ammonium chloride. All these are examples of elemental substances that go to sublimation. Let's see the example of that or the diagram of that. Now, we have our Benson burner. We also have our Petri dish. Over here, we have China dish, the same as Petri dish. And then we have a funnel, so we only invent our funnel. So we have inverted funnel. It means a funnel that has been turned upside down on it. And then we have a cotton plug at the other part or on top of the funnel that has been inverted because we don't want whatever is being generated to move away. And then we have our ammonium chloride salt. Because we are matching it up with so much heat, what happens is that the ammonium chloride salt will now sublime. So you see the vapor 
and the ammonium chloride salts will now cling or get stuck onto the walls of the emitted funnel. That shows how they sublime. If you are thinking of this, don't think any further because when you go buy naphthalene balls or what we commonly call camphor, put camphor in your wardrobe or in your suitcase or probably in your school bag. And then you see how it will diffuse and get into your clothes. As it does that, the quantity or the nature of the camphor or naphthalene bulb also reduces in size. That should give you a clear indication that it has gone through what is called sublimation. All right, sublimation. So these are what you need. You, have, you need your Benson burner, Petri dish or China dish. You have your cotton plug, and then you have your funnel, which would definitely be turned upside down, as we commonly call inverted. And then that brings us to the end of today's lesson. Without much we do, we'll do a quick recap of whatever we learned today. The main discussion for today is on mixtures. And I say that a mixture is a physical combination of two or more substances or elements. So I can have something here and then another thing here. When I put them together in a different bowl, I have a mixture. And mixtures are commonly done in our homes. We do our stews of all kinds of colors. We do our soups of all kinds and colors. We do our juices of all kinds and colors. And all these are as a result of, let's say, if I want to have an orange juice, maybe I'll need, say, orange. I need to go for a bit of ginger. And then you spice them up. And because all of these are together, you are having a mixture. In as much as there are different components or different state of matter, a mixture is produced. And I also say that mixtures always can be combined in any ratio or proportion. It can be, let's say, one um, cm cube of water against one sh um, cu um, cube of sugar. Or I'd go for 10 cups of sugar in one glass of water. It's a mixture. I can do it any way that I want to do it. It's a mixture. Then we also spoke about the fact that the different components of or the constituents which still retain their properties, they don't mix up. The fact that this and this are together doesn't mean that they are completely mixed up. They all have their properties. Also, they are always separated by a physical means. So if I have, let's say, um, pebble and then chalk, I put them into a bowl, I can sit in my home, take the pebble out, and then have my chalk pieces. That's also one. We went on to talk about classification of mixtures, whereby we said we have six of them. And these six are, we have solid, we have liquid, we have gas. So we can have solid, solid mixture, solid gas mixture, solid liquid mixture, gas solid mixture, Gas, gas mixture, gas, liquid mixture. And then liquid, gas mixture, liquid, liquid mixture, and then liquid, solid mixture with examples. Then we went on to talk about types of solution. We said that whenever we say a solution, a solution is a uniform or homogeneous mixture of a solute and a solvent. So when I put sugar into water, whereby I can't get my sugar away from my water, then I have what is called a solution. We said the other name for a solution is also called, mm -hmm. no. We said that we have a type of mixture called liquid, liquid mixture. And then we didn't mention that that can also have two categories or two types, like homogeneous mixture, which can be referred to as miscible liquid. So homogeneous means that we have two different components whereby being brought together, there's no difference between them. So let's say water and then let's say alcohol, appetition, if you can say it that way. I pour appetition, one, say, um, cup or I don't, I don't know, into water, and then you don't see any difference between them because that gives you homogeneity, complete one. You can't say this, you can't say that, you see? And they also mentioned another one as heterogeneous. 
two different uh, messages being brought together whereby, or two different substances being brought together whereby there's a clear difference between them, kerosene and water. As soon as you pour kerosene into water, you can see that the kerosene comes on top of the water because water is much, much denser than kerosene. Water is much, much denser than kerosene. From there, we also want to talk about types of solution, whereby we said concentrated solution, saturated solution, dilute solution, and the other one called aqueous solution. Then from there, we went straight to talk about separation of mixtures. We, speak, we, well, we spoke about uh, filtration. We spoke about, we have um, simple filtration. And then we have fractional, um, simple um, decantation, sorry. Um, simple um, distillation, simple distillation. And then we have fractional distillation. Now, simple distillation is mostly used in people who actually um, go through the whole process to acquire uh, palm wine. Palm wine, good. Now, you know, they add the palm wine and then some things and then the... But typically, it is mostly very, very common if you want to brew or prepare uh, appetition. Because when they are doing appetition, they need palm wine and water. to so many processes and then chemical forms and then you get your palm wine. And then we have fractional distillation that also happens with um, liquids that have very close boiling point. For example, we can have crude oil that will have... Um, Bitumen in that. Bitumen is just the, the, what you call the quota. So it is not really um, a part that plays so much importance. But then if you have fuel for uh, airplanes, if you have kerosene, if you have LPG gas, if you have diesel, if you have petrol, all these things come together to form what is called crude oil. How do you get a different fraction from it? By using what is called fractional distillation. We went on, we went on to talk about sublimation whereby we spoke about things that sublime. Sublimation simply means that in a solid state, material or object that can go through the gaseous state without passing through the liquid state. And I did mention of camphor or naphthalene ball. You know why I'm laughing? I'm laughing because I'm just going through this over and over and over again. Now, it's bad, but I need to go. That brings us to the end of today's lesson. And till I meet you again, I say good luck, be blessed, and then Bye-bye. Channel Joy Learning TV.